What is going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here we are, another episode of Getting Buzzed. I'm Howard Bender. With me, of course, as you just saw the credits roll, my man, who is he? Oh, yeah, Ryan Hallam. Oh, man. <laughs> it, man. like, slipped my mind for, like, a brief second. I don't know what it is. Could be the Red Solo Cup, for <laughs> crying out loud. Is it? Uh, what time is it right now? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate everybody stopping by here. Ryan and I, lots to talk about here today. And it's a great show also, uh, because uh, later on here in tonight's show, we're going to be joined by none other than Jeff Manns, right? Everybody remembers Jeff Manns, right? He's uh, on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. He is with uh, Fantasy Guru and uh, and the Elite Sports Network. So uh, Jeff's going to drop in here, but Ryan and I... At least we're going to start things up. Ryan, how are you, man? What's going on? I'm good, dude. It's uh, tomorrow's Friday. Well, I guess when people are watching this, it'll be Friday. It's the weekend. Weather's beautiful up here. We can do things again, man. Uh, man, sports are going. Things are great. Are you vaxxed? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely, man. You got the double whammy? I got the double whammy. Nice, nice. Yeah. I'm actually due for my second one on the 22nd of May. Uh, and and we'll see what happens there. Everybody everybody's got that horror story of uh, oh uh, all laid up. Oh my God. oh my arm was so swollen. Oh I can't believe it. So I think I was good. Trying to put the fear in me. I was good. I know our producer Matt Sells was pretty good. So don't don't listen to the horror stories. Drink lots of water and uh, just relax. There you go. There you go. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's kick things off here with probably the the biggest news. Uh, this side of the Mississippi, probably the other side of the Mississippi, too. Um, I can't believe that it's May. And the biggest story is the schedule release for the NFL. Like, I mean, listen, before we even get to that, I'll challenge you right now, Ryan. No, not to a chug contest. Although maybe <laughs> next time I should because you uh, you're pretty weak the last time. But I challenge you to find a sports story right now that's bigger than... The NFL schedule release. Sadly, I guess there isn't one. Uh, you know, Major League Baseball is in full swing, but I can't think of any, like, real story going on there. Uh, you know, just day-to-day and some injuries happening. But the NFL, as we always say, is king. Uh, so you know, everything they do, and they take advantage. Like, they know they're king, and they're taking advantage of it. Like, what other league would set out a, a primetime show to release their schedule Especially when a lot of it is leaked beforehand anyway. But you know what? People all day long were tweeting about it. They were ready. You know, there was leaks. And, and it's just like people lost their mind. And I'm like, you already knew who they were playing. It was just a matter of what weeks. I don't know why that was so exciting, but it is. Everything the NFL does is gold. Well, you know what, though? And, and I'll say this. And I'll save the rant for last call uh, tonight. But you got to credit the NFL here because... They came with some heat. They came with some drama. Now, I know. I mean, listen, it's the schedule release, and, you know, who the hell knows? I mean, the most exciting part about the schedule release for me personally uh, was knowing whether or not I needed to draft another friggin' tight end in my best ball draft uh, because all of a sudden now bye weeks are, are you know, evident. And anybody who's been doing a best ball draft in uh, in recent weeks right now since the NFL draft hit – um, we've just been flying blind. I mean, I went into uh, this one best ball draft that I'm doing for uh, our friends over at the Football Diehards, uh, and the first thing I looked at, I was like, oh, damn, I need another tight end right now. And that sucks because we're at the tail end of the draft, and the rest of the tight ends are cockapoo So do you usually go with one in a best ball? In a best ball draft? No, I go with two tight ends. Oh, two, okay. You, right, I thought the, you, what you were two saying, tight ends now I need took, to have the same bye week. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right? Are you with sometimes. me? Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, oh. Isn't that in uh, Dumb and Dumber? Oh, you, <laughs> you have to excuse my friend. He's a little slow. He's a little <laughs> slow. You got to use the uh, the unagi. Yeah, I got it now. Um. So yeah. So that was that was my biggest thing. But I'll tell you what, man. Like, you look ahead at the schedule, and you know the 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 leaked week one. They brought some drama. They really did. I mean, come on. 
the Cowboys versus the Bucks to open the season. Cowboys are the number one team in the NFL wagered on. They are the most wagered on team in the history of gambling on football. I mean, everybody, you know, because that's the team that everybody knows, right? And if if you're if you're not a football fan, and let's say you stumble into Vegas and you look at the sports book and you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna put a couple of bets down here, right? Oh, let me see, oh, uh, Panthers, uh, Bucks, uh, uh, oh, Cowboys. There you go, and that's what happens. And so you know, it's like Notre Dame football. It's the same thing. Somebody comes in, they see that college slate. They immediately go to Notre Dame because that's the school they know. And they don't, you know, they're either going to bet with Notre Dame because they like Notre Dame or they're going to bet against Notre Dame because they hate Notre Dame. They don't even know shit about Notre Dame football, right? They don't know. They couldn't name three players on the Notre Dame squad, but they'll bet Notre Dame because they're in Vegas and that's kind of what you do. So you put the Cowboys against the defending champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers who... You know, I guess Tom Brady, the uh, general manager of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, decided that he wanted to bring back everybody, basically. I mean, then they basically did. They brought back the entire team from last year. And so so that right off the bat, there's drama. There's narrative right there. That makes it popular. I was trying to convince Adam Ronis about this or talk to him about it. And he was just like, nah. well, everybody's excited about week one anyway. Yeah, everybody's excited about week one anyway. But, you know. The schedule makers are strolling down Narrative Street, and I'll give you one reason why. Uh, why we know this. Why? Uh, yes, I get that the AFC East is playing the NFC South, but Week One, Jets at Carolina, Sam Darnold revenge game narrative. I mean, that's you know, I mean, that's that's something big. The 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 you know NFC North. Um, has a couple of out of you know in conference but out of division games. What they do? They gave the Lions the Rams. Why? Matt Stafford versus um, versus Jared Goff, the two teams who swapped quarterbacks. That's that's going to be a narrative. That's not Week One. That's um, when is that? That's Week Seven. But nevertheless, that's what we're looking at. And I got to give credit to the NFL for bringing the heat, bringing the drama. Um, I might hate talking football month of May, but, you know, argue against that. No, and I was going to bring up that that Sam Darnold game, and I figured you're going to turn your nose up at it because I know. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it's like it's almost like the NFL schedule. Make, it's, like, it's like they bring in the WWE guys like, all right, find us some storylines here. Where can we put it? And you're right. They, it's, it's all season long. Uh, you know, of course, week one. They did really great. Obviously, Dallas and Tampa Bay. Everybody's going to watch that first game anyway because we haven't seen football since February. But to come with that game, you're going to grab a lot of casual fans also that I'm sure they want to try to hold on to. But then Sunday and Monday, they really kind of dropped the ball to me. Like the Ravens and Raiders on Monday, it, just, it, it seemed like the schedule makers really think the Raiders are going to be something this year. I feel like they got a bunch of primetime games. I don't think it has anything to do with – the Raiders, them, like whether or not the Raiders are good, I think it has everything to do with Monday Night Football, Las Vegas. That doesn't do anything for the ratings, though. You think more people are going to watch it because the game's being played in Vegas? I mean, maybe more yeah, people I, I will think, go to Vegas. I think I everybody's going to tune in for that. I mean, listen, everybody tunes in for Monday Night Football anyway. But now you're going to see you know, a significant amount of action on it there. In Vegas, and you're probably gonna get you're probably gonna get a lot of action, you know, for that Monday night game. I mean, listen, no, week two's Monday night game, or yeah, is is the Monday night game Kansas City, Baltimore, or is that the Sunday night game? But that's what's going on in week two. That's definitely a better game, but Raiders were uh week one Monday night football last year, too. Yeah. And they did away with the doubleheader, which I'm okay with. That it was it was fine either way. Uh the first Monday night. I, I wasn't married to that idea. I know probably in the West Coast, it's probably nice for you for the second game to start at 7, but for the second game to start at 10, you know, here on the East Coast, I think the how many viewers were they really drawing when the game ended at 1 o'clock? Yeah. No, listen, I, I understand that also. I don't mind losing the, the, the double headers on Monday night. I did enjoy them. I did, but I, I think if, I, if I'm going to piss and moan about anything, because, well, that's what I do. I like to piss and moan. But if I'm going to piss and moan about anything, it's got to be the way they structured the bye weeks. <laughs> what were they thinking? Why? I think what is it the like week six or seven? Yes. 
There's like six teams on a bye. But meanwhile, you've got a couple of other weeks where it's like two teams are on a bye, two teams are on a bye, uh, four teams are on a bye, two teams are on a bye. Like, why are we jamming all these uh, these bye weeks there? And then what do they throw? Like four teams on a bye in week 14? Yep. I that that I don't understand. Like, how are you going to structure your your fantasy football leagues? Like, are you just going to tack on an extra week of the regular season and then go weeks 15, 16, and 17 as your championship? That's what I assume, yeah. It's just going to back it up a week from, from last year. So just like last year, you know, last year, week 13, there was buys, which was even dumber last year because nobody was on by 12, and then they put two teams on by in 13. Uh it's going to be the week before what the fantasy football playoffs would be. There's going to be significant teams on by. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how you feel about that infecting your draft. Personally, for me, you know, your team looks very different in August than it does in December. So I'm not sure that I, I draft according to that week, you know, 14 by. Uh, but certainly it's going to get in a lot of people's heads. Well, who's it going to screw over? Let's see. Colts. Oh, great. My team defense. Damn it. Um, so you lose Carson Wentz. You lose Jonathan Taylor. Um, just Pretty to, much it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, Michael Pittman might be worth something there. We'll uh, Miami, you're losing, you know, whatever. Miles Gaskin, Will Fuller, Devontae Parker. Waddle. Waddle, Gesicki. Um, You're not losing much on the Patriots side. Nope. Probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then, truth be told, I don't necessarily know if you're really missing that much on the Eagles side. No, so they didn't screw over fantasy football too bad with the uh, week 14 buys this time. But last no, week, but- later, last year, it would have been McCaffrey if he was healthy, and then all the Tampa Bay guys. Yeah. Oh God, everybody pissing and moaning about that one. Um, yeah, I don't. I, you know, I, I haven't really looked at the uh, at the the way it is because. I just assume, like you, I just assume put an extra week onto the regular season. So instead of cutting it off at, you know, week 12, you cut it off at week 13 or, you know, or, you know, week 14, you do it this time. But then I guess the question is, is what do we look at for week 17? Are we going to have teams sitting players in week 17? Um, Or is it just, you know, or, or is that basically the same as our old fear of whether or not somebody was going to be, Whatever somebody was gonna, to, I just, I just lost my point there. Well, I feel like it's been, <laughs> I feel like it's been less in recent years that we've seen sit teams sit guys two weeks early. You know, I, I feel like maybe four or five years ago that was, you know, a little more prevalent than it is now. I, I feel like even some teams are playing their guys even through the last week. It's really just the the teams that really have like maybe if they have the number one sewn up that are sitting guys like Kansas City did last year. Uh, I don't see too much of sitting guys two weeks because that's really tough to to kind of sit guys two weeks and then try to turn it on for the playoffs. It's it's awfully risky. Uh, so I I, w- I would think leagues are going to end in week seventeen this year. I don't really commission you know com- not really commissioner really any leagues really anymore. Uh, but I, that's what I would do. All right. Um, Thanksgiving slate to me looks average at best. I don't really think that there are great games there. But I mean, who knows? We'll see what happens. Um, when we move further, I mean, listen, you know, it's Detroit. I don't give a crap about the Cowboys. I don't give a crap about, um, I think the night game, the late game was the only one that was even remotely intriguing. What, Buffalo what? Indy, Buffalo Indy, Buffalo Indy. Yeah. Is that week nine, week 10? What is, I think what is week 12 or 13? You know, Thanksgiving is always going to get viewership because nobody wants to sit and talk to grandma about why they're not dating someone or, you know, what you're doing it for work these days. Like, it's the same bullshit with your family. You know, maybe people want to be with their families more this year because maybe last year you didn't do it. But nobody really likes to talk to their family. It's always the same goddamn questions because, you know, we don't really pay attention to each other anyway. So we have to fake catch up on things on holidays. So I think the NFL always has a viewership. I know it's always on in my house. I don't think my father gives a damn who's in the house you know, or what's going on. We're watching football. Yeah, we're pretty much the same way there. Although I, I tell you, you know, I, I always, you know, my, my, my favorite thing to do was to sit next to uh, the, 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 like, either Aunt Mary or Grandma Mamie. Because if you wanted to have, like, you know, the little old lady who says a lot of inappropriate stuff under her breath, 
She's a little racist. She's also, you know, just a little bitter about her life in general. Um, that's actually that was that was always the place that I used to hang out there. <laughs> Until you know what the problem was, I realized we're that old racist person at the uh, at the table now. Like you know, the whole like changing pronouns and all the other stuff that you know that that, that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, the they, the them, this, that. I, I'm like, I, you know, I, I don't know it. I'm gonna sound stupid trying to, you know, make a point of it or whatever. So yeah, just put Howard at the at the corner of the table there. Let him sit there and and you know say inappropriate things to you know under his breath. And maybe somewhere I've got like a nephew or a you know a, a niece or something like that who wants to hang out with the old timer and. Listen to some funny shit. Now they're going to put you on TikTok. They're going to be like, watch what this guy says. And they're going to put a camera in your face. And next thing you know, you're going to be all over TikTok. Right? It would be my first TikTok because I'm not on TikTok. I mean, I'm on it. I have not done anything with it. But I yeah, know it, right. it's sure. all. Come on. It's your daughter cool Morgan hasn't are. gotten you to do any kind of dance on TikTok. No, she's a big TikToker. Uh, it's a it's a funny story in the house because we all want to be her friend, and she's pretty much blocked us all. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but uh, no, I see her practice because she hasn't she hasn't blocked me. Oh, I see her. She'll sit there and she'll be like this to it. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're like, I'm practicing. I'm like, that's not a dance. I'm not sure what is going on here. But you just threw your arm. Like, that's legitimately what's going on. So That's called I whacking, know. I think. Is that what it is? Look at you knowing things. Right? Well, you know, the wife's got me watching things like So You Think You Can Dance. So oh, I'm, I'm in on that. Um, all right. The other thing that I wanted to touch on here real quick. What's up with the NFL? Trying to muscle in on Christmas Day. Dude, right? Wasn't Christmas Day? Didn't that belong to the NBA for a while? Like poor, poor, poor NBA. Now all of a sudden they're gonna they want to start their season on Christmas Day, and everybody's gonna be like, oh, I don't give a crap about Game One of the NBA. Give me my uh, give me my my football here. It's actually decent games this year. The Browns and Packers, assuming that Aaron Rodgers is still in Green Bay, and then Colts Cardinals. I mean. It's kind of a mismatching game, but both teams should be pretty decent. So, I mean, there could be two games with playoff implications. So, sorry, NBA. Yeah, right? You lose. The NBA, MLB is getting mowed over by, uh, by, by you know, the draft and mini camps and the schedule and release. And the schedule release. <laughs> Baseball's good. These are our games, and the NFL's like, we're telling you who you're playing five months from now. And everybody's like, yes. NFL, right? You already, you already knew who the opponents were, and they're still making a bigger deal out of the NFL than Major League Baseball. That's playing games. That's all you need to know. Sad, 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 sad. All right. Well, then I'll tell you what, man. Let's wrap up our schedule talk here, and let's get down to something even more fun than the NFL. Um, and that's time for our uh, tonight's getting buzzed top ten. And Ryan. Uh, you came up with this week's Getting Buzz Top 10 topic of discussion. Why don't you tell the crowd what we tried sifting through? Well, you know, we, we went kind of uh, off sports topics the first couple episodes. So this week we're going the top 10 sports movies of all time. Now, here's the problem, because okay. you and I were going through our top 10 lists and top 10, you know, top sports movies. I can go 20, 30 deep easily without batting an eye and I, I mean to pare it down to the top 10 was insanely difficult so while we're gonna go 10 through one here and reveal uh our choices um by all means you know give us a shout with uh with yours you can tweet us at fantasy alarm ryan you can read is at fighting chance i'm at roto buzz guy um hashtag getting buzz you can discuss our uh top 10 uh best sports movies of of all time and listen i know that we're gonna rattle through ours and 20 different people are like, duh, 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 you forgot this one how come you didn't say this movie and they're gonna sound like that too at least in my head when i'm reading their messages but nevertheless let's reveal tonight's getting buzz top 10 best sports movies number 10 who doesn't love Caddyshack, baby, right? I Technically, know. it's more of a coming-of-age movie than a sports movie, but 
Damn, give me Danny Noonan, Judge yep. Smells, uh, The Bishop. Uh, how about Ty Webb? And of course, Carl Spackler, baby. Golf movie extraordinaire is Caddyshack, no doubt. Yeah, there's no question if this is this is got to be if this is on your top 10 then I don't you have something wrong with you. I mean, it's just hilarious. I get it's from the 80s, so maybe some of our audience hasn't seen it, but that's your homework assignment, America. If you haven't seen Caddyshack, uh, go see it. And Danny Noonan, by the way, is on a show now called City on a Hill with uh, Kevin Bacon, which is really excellent. So if anyone, I always see on Twitter, I need a new show to watch. Watch City on a Hill. It's on Showtime's pretty damn good. There you go. Um, do you know the last line of the movie, Caddyshack? I, I'm sorry, I don't. Hey, everybody, we're all gonna get laid. <laughs> That's right. Right. I didn't know. Was, yeah, I knew that. I didn't know that was the last one. That's 80s the extraordinaire, right there. Boom. Number nine. We're staying in the PGA, baby. That's right. Happy Gilmore, hockey player, does good on the PGA tour. You gotta love it, man. Adam Sandler, Carl oh, Weathers, right? How great. And he's got a big feud with uh, Christopher McDonald on Twitter, if you haven't uh, seen them go back and forth. And that's, so that's that's pretty good that they're still kind of doing it today. But I, I, you can't go through Happy Gilmore without, you eat pieces of shit for breakfast. <laughs> like, that's just classic Dude, I lines. interviewed Christopher McDonald on the <laughs> Fantasy Alarm show, and I asked him the question. I'm like, what's the, what's the best thing that somebody's ever said to you while you're on the golf course? And he's like, in my backswing, you eat little pieces of shit for breakfast. He was phenomenal. All right, number eight. This is one. This is mine. You don't like this movie, which I'm blown away by. But how, you got to explain to me why you don't like Hoosiers. Jimmy yeah, Shipwood, Coach Dale, Gene Hackman. Come on, Barbara Hershey. I mean, she's not like, you know, drop dead gorgeous. But you know what? In kind of a country bumpkin kind of farm girl way, she's, you know, a little bit of a smoke show. It's not that I don't like it. I guess it's just kind of overdone, and it's not like you didn't know what was going to happen at the end. So I, I, I guess uh, it's more of just – it's just over – just, it was just a little too goody-goody for me, I guess, or, or too predictable. Oh, okay. All right. It's because he originally came from the Ithaca Warriors, and, uh, and, and you, you're, you resent Ithaca being that you're, like, in the Albany region. About an hour south, but yes. There you go. See, I just gave the entire world where to find you. So if somebody kill, <laughs> wants to kill Ryan, just go to Lake Albany. Katrine, Lake Katrine, New York. No one wants to find me. Someone <laughs> said that to me once. I posted something on Twitter like, your address is on there. Like, no one wants to find me. Let's right. be honest. Exactly. <laughs> if you do, great. Uh, number seven on the list here, Major League. Come on. Jake Taylor, Wild Thing, Pedro Serrano. Oh. I uh, love this one. Lou Brown. Bob Euchre. Bob Euchre. Everybody's just a bit outside. That <laughs> is just, it's just hilarious because, you know, how bad were the Indians for so long? And then, like, when they finally got good, it was kind of weird because it was like, you know, because that really did, like, encapsulate the the Indians for the longest time. I think, you know, until, like, what, the mid-90s, they were just that awful. And so... It was uh, it was a great movie just to see like the the ownership try to tank the team and then all the misfits come together. It's just hilarious. Great movie. Love that. Love that. Yeah, like right as I, right, that movie came out, and then all of a sudden you had like Manny Ramirez and Albert Bell, and all Grady of a sudden this, what's that? Grady Sizemore. Grady Sizemore. Oh boy, microfracture surgery ruined that poor guy. It sure did. Ruined. All right, number six on the list here. This one's near and dear to my heart. I love this movie. I will over and over and over and over and over again watch this movie. Slapshot. Come on, man. The Charlestown Chiefs, baby. It's been a while since I've seen it, so I do. I really need to give it a, 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 another viewing, but I, it is so funny. And again, this is another one that goes a little back. If you're younger, definitely watch it. The Hanson Brothers. Uh, and just you know, politically incorrect and, and everything uh, that the 80s comedies movies were is all encapsulated and you get hockey in it as well. Was that in the 80s? I thought that was in the late 70s. It could have been. It could have been. I You're probably the right. late 70s. And I'll tell you what, man, if you want the greatest of songs, like one song that will always just jet me back to like, you know, the late 70s and, and this movie – uh, Maxine Nightingale's uh, Right Back Where It Started From. You know that one? 
No. Ooh, and it's all right, baby, coming home. We got to get it right back to where it started from. You don't know that one? If I do, it's not off that rendition. I'd have to, I'll have to look it up after. I think they, um, what was the, oh, did you see the Starsky and Hutch remake with uh, Ben no. Stiller and Owen Wilson? Oh, no, dude, I did not. It's fucking his <laughs> <laughs> That's got to see with that in there. All right, never mind. Number five. <laughs> Now I want to watch it right now. <laughs> Number five, uh, the best line. Let's see. Can I mean you know what I'm talking about here? Can anybody tell me how about Marla Hooch? What a hitter! <laughs> <laughs> I was also thinking of when uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Jimmy Dugan signs the ball to for the kid avoid the clap. <laughs> clap, Jimmy Dugan. <laughs> So that's a league of their own, in case you haven't figured that out, because everyone just knows there's no crying in baseball uh, in the, what, two-and-a-half-minute piss that he takes in the, in the one scene. But uh, there's, <laughs> there's just so much good to that movie, on top of a pretty good story. And, and uh, you know, Gina Davis is pretty cool in that movie. But uh, yeah, that's a great one, too. It's a, it's a good story, good acting, and a lot of funny lines. A lot of great lines in that movie. Oh, my God. Oh, man, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose. <laughs> All right, number four, how about this? How about this? Number four is a movie that the Fantasy Alarm NASCAR Writer of the Year, <laughs> two-time Writer of the Year, has not seen. You gotta go, Ricky Bobby. I wanna go fast, I wanna go fast. Give me my Talladega Nights. If you're not first, you're last. But then the other one, and I thought this line was most fitting for the show, is let me quote the late, great Colonel Sanders when he said, I'm too drunk to taste this chicken. <laughs> Number three, let's do the tearjerker. The, oh, I want to play catch with my dad. I don't want to play catch with my dad. My dad was an a-hole. But meanwhile, <laughs> Field of Dreams, that's the, the tug it on the heartstrings there. Uh, Kevin Costner, James Earl Jones. Jones. Moonlight Graham. That's uh, that's easily the best nickname. Moonlight Graham. It's got to be one of the top nicknames of all time. I think it's like the baseball purist favorite movie of all time. Like the people who who want never want the National League to get the DH and all that. Like I feel like you know they go home and they have a little fun with themselves watching Field of Dreams. Just a little. Right. <laughs> like Ray, Ray. Baseball has stood the test of time, Ray, and they're like. Oh, they're like, yeah. they're with their wife and say, tell me if they build it, it will come. <laughs> if you build it, you'll come too. <laughs> Number two, this one's unbelievable. I, you uh, know, love this movie, love the, the, the social meaning, love the movie itself, love the acting that went down there. Remember the Titans. Titans. You can't you can't replace a Gary Bertier. You nah, just can't do it. This is this is also one of my favorites. It might be my favorite. Like you said, not only the the social part of it, but just first of all, you can't go wrong with Denzel. The man is freaking awesome. Uh, and then two kids, Bertier and, and Julius. You know the the way their relationship uh, forms during the movie. Even you know the coach's daughter. She's a little spitfire and is awesome. It's just so I can't think of who that is too. She's somebody famous now. Hayden Pantier. That who, yes, I knew it was somebody, and I, I meant to look it up before we started, and I forgot. But uh, yeah, and then the funny thing was uh, Julius, and it threw me off when I watched The Wire, and he was Avon Barksdale. I'm like, uh, I can't. It took me, it took me a couple episodes to like forget that he was, you know, Julius from Remember the Titans, and he was the badass drug dealer. Yeah, he also played uh, the uh, Michael B. Jordan's brother in uh, the Creed movies. Oh, okay, I didn't see those. Well, I just ruined him for you. Well, that's you okay. <laughs> Best part about Remember the Titans, seriously, I love, love, love that speech uh, from Coach Yost. I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night. Like that that speech right there, you're just like, ooh, like I got goosebumps right here. Like, I, you know, hairless arms. Sorry, world. But um, I got goosebumps right now. Just even just doing that line. That, that psh- Unbelievable. And he um, sounded just like him. I know. I know. Well, that's, you know, I, I try. I try. It's my acting chops, baby. That's true. It's my you acting are, chops. You are a uh, clinically, uh, classically trained actor. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. 
Um, at, would you like to reveal the number one movie that we've got here? And number one, we're going back to the 70s again. And this was, I'll say the first time I saw my father cry is at the end of this movie. Uh, and it's when, yo, Adrian, I did it. <laughs> it's Rocky. And I, I think it's the first one. I mean, they kind of get, you know, a little dopier as they go. I think Rocky Four is a nice little uh, back to, like, something. Like, three was Hulk Hogan and Mr. T. It was really starting to fall off the rails. What's and wrong then, with that? What's, what's wrong with Thunder Lips and Clubber Lang? He got he got body slammed over the ropes in a so four was really good but the first one is just classic uh, you know from from start to finish you can't beat it yeah I mean I I want to say something about the ending of the movie but lo and behold uh, our producer today Matt Sells who in addition to not having seen Talladega Nights or Slapshot has never seen the movie Rocky I will tell you what's most impressive I don't know if you've ever have you ever heard a, a an interview with Stallone. Like, I mean, not recently. Crazy articulate, um, very intelligent man, uh, wrote and directed Rocky. Like, 1976 Oscar winner, yep. all right? Sylvester Stallone. That that really kind of blows me away. Like, that still, to this day, knowing the Stallone, like, not even the Rocky franchise, but you had the Rambo franchise, and you had all just those, like, you know, meat sack movies that were just... You know, you were just like, all right, you know. I mean, he was like a big blockbuster action star. I mean, like, except for Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there we go, guys. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right. Top 10 was, best sports. I, what's that? I got I got a little problem. What, what's about? I, 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 don't, I don't really know how to tell you. I, I, need, to, I, need, to, I need to leave. What do you got to do? Right in the middle of the show. I got a poopy. I, dude, I got to go. It's not, it's not even funny. I really do. Well, then I'll tell you what. Then we will uh, we'll, we'll tag Brian out of here. Uh, and he's already out of here. Well, that leaves no, nothing else to do than to bring in our guest tonight. You guys know him. You love him. From uh, Elite Sports Network and Fantasy Guru, Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio, my friend, your friend, Jeff Manns. Uh, here he is, Jeff Manns, everybody. Jeff, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for dropping in here today. Really appreciate you uh, you joining the show. It's been way too long for you and I, Jeff. Way too long. I know. We're too busy, Howard. We never get the time. Our schedules never end up syncing up. But every now and then, there's like once a year where the moon, the stars, the sun align, and you get Howard and Jeff on the same uh, show somewhere. And I'm uh, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, man. I love this. So how how are you? Let's let's just start with that, man. Like seriously, like how you been? What time do you have? Well, uh, uh, I'm good. I'm good. Everything's good. I mean, shit. It's be- oops. Can I? I can swear, right? Or can I not? All right. Uh, we could. By all it. means. All right. By all means. I, I mean, I'm good. It's sports are back. It's so much better. Like 2020 was an absolute crap show. Um. So I, I'm just happy to have. Live baseball back, um, live sports back, NBA season just finished. I won a fantasy basketball championship, Howard. Can you freaking believe that? Uh, no, I actually, I, I, that I can't believe. That that probably has something to, more to do with Xander than it does to you. <laughs> yes, 100% more with him than it did to me. But I got that, yeah, I, I got to do a draft and I kind of like, I, I, this is me. It's just basically like I, I'm doing other work and stuff and he's coming, should I pick up Kyle Kuzma? I'm like, yeah, yeah, pick up Kyle Kuzma, and then he just went and did it, and the whole thing. But yeah, it was so man having sports back. It, it's a much better year. I'm looking to bigger and better things this year. Yeah, we sat there going through you know the pandemic and trying to create content out of thin air was always like at one point I got so desperate on Sirius XM that I literally I called my wife during the show uh-huh. and asked her what was for dinner. That was. <laughs> Yeah, and that was that was a segment right there because then Bowden started asking her questions. Oh. And I was like, oh, I can just sit back here now. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, when Jim starts interrogating, that's never a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it worked out funny. well. But you know, one of the things that we did was um we did like a whole meet the family thing here over at, at Fantasy Alarm. We got a chance to like just kind of get to know people a little bit more. You know, we sit there and we give out you know, we're on the air all the time, you know, and or we're sitting there in chat rooms and we're yeah. giving out fantasy advice. But, 
you know, like people just don't people don't really know us. They they treat us like they do know us, like they're you know we're best friends, but they don't really know anything. So I just kind of wanted to you know pick your brain a little bit, just you know oh. tell your story because I, I mean I know your story and I know what you know life is like for you. So I kind of wanted to you know carry that through because. You know, you've got kids, you've got a wife, you made the move from Chicago to Arizona. Yeah. Um, you've been through the, you know, you've been through the ringer, basically. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, thanks for having me on for to do that. But yeah, I mean, I'm like, what story does he want me to tell? I have so many, um, you know, life is like, people do, they, you know, I, I, they think they know us because the perception or but whatever we put out on radio or wherever couple hours a day, but there's a lot more to that. That's the thing is I, I accused recently, somebody's like, oh, you don't even care. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, bitch, it's 4 a.m. I'm right. I'm writing stuff up. You don't. You can say, Jeff, your work is garbage. No problem. Oh, I get it. Maybe it is. But don't, don't give me that. I don't care bullshit. That stuff really drives me nuts. So um, that's the stuff that will set me off. But where do you want me to start? Where do you want where do you want to start the fantasy journey? You want to start? Remember us meeting for the first time? Do people know that? Us meeting for the first time. Oh, you know what? I mean, I know my end of the story there. What was you know, I, I'll tell you what. Why don't you tell the story? Let's uh let's let's uh, see if it if it jibes. Yeah. Um <laughs> the FSTA meeting. Um, I think it was I can't remember the name of the restaurant. It's a good one though. We had the FSTA like after conference whatever it is like a, a shindig like a dinner or whatever and i you know i've always kind of uh, outsider i was never on the inside of the fsta crowd um friends with a lot of those people but never on the inside and so like me and hallam at the time were out there in san francisco and uh lo and behold there, there's this uh, crafty witty bartender that um just starts doing the heavy-handed pour for us and starts talking about like what's the uh, starts talking about the industry and all of a sudden the who knows he works there and I'm like, what you're working at Roto. I think you're working at Rotowire at the time and stuff. And I'm like, Holy shit, this is pretty good. So we ended up talking, I think Hallam and I talked to you for like the whole evening. If I'm not mistaken. We did. We talked a bunch. And that was when, um, you know, you were telling me that you were from Chicago. Hallam said that he was from Albany and I just did a hit on some radio station in Albany. You remember Alan fish? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that one. Yep. Do you remember the when, when you know? I guess like Hallam texted him right there was like you know what do you think of Howard Bender? And uh, I think that the comment was he's really good. He knows his stuff. A little dry. Oh yeah, yeah. There you go. Well, so, good thing nothing's changed, so it's it's good. Oh man, <laughs> I think it was it was at that point. Seriously, like I mean, when did you like listen? You 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 studied broadcasting. You got into it. Like when, what was the point where you like found your voice? Because like, that was the, the real interesting thing. You remember the movie private parts yeah. and, uh, and he's like, he's doing that radio voice. Like, Hey, you're listening to WWW. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But then he became like real during that read and, and stuff like that. Like that was, that to me is like where you find your voice. Like, where did you find yours? Yeah. I mean, great question. Um, I, was fortunate. It's weird because I had a story. Um, I grew up with, around radio. Like my mom drove a bus, and uh, and I used to have to you know ride the bus in the summers and everything else. So she would ride. My mom was addicted to radio. Like Wally Phillips, Bob Collins in the mornings. I, I remember overnight Sally Jesse Raphael before she had a show. She did local like syndicated radio overnight. My mom had a transistor radio her entire life. Literally, it was like you know every year we'd get her a new one because it'd wear out. So then sports radio started in like 1992 in Chicago, and then the score was on. And so I'd listen to the score all the time. So um, I went to school for journalism. I was going to be a writer. I didn't really know. I didn't think I was going to be a broadcaster, right? Like I didn't think of that angle. I thought I was sports writer. It was like all I wanted to do. Uh, and, and I went to school for that. And then I got I had an illness, so I had to drop out, come back a year and a half later. And at that point, I'm like, you know, screw it. I had I was quicker to a computer science degree than I was a journalism degree. So I just went and finished off computer science and got into the tech sector a little bit, always, you know, trying to come back and eventually doing it in the in the industry. I found my voice. I had a voice right away. Pretty quickly, they uh, uh, Todd Farino and a couple of these guys, uh, Ryan was working for him at that point, And I joined up and he was doing podcasts. What's a podcast? I didn't know what a podcast was. But I got on there and I was 
loud and boisterous. And I just kind of, you know, I feel like I had that because the timing has been in me, but I didn't really know it. And then uh, when Hallam and I got that, when Todd was out, because he's wanted to, perfect, he was he was a uh, uh, pig vomit. Like he was like, oh, you got to hit the kills. You got to do this and all that. And then Hallam and I, he's like, I'll throw you out with this other scumbag, Ryan Hallam. And then me and Hallam mixed, and it was like playing off each other, and we had fun. And it was a joy to do shows. And we did a show called Midnight Oil on Blog Talk Radio, like midnight Eastern time. So, uh, you know, real late night, hardly anybody would listen, but eventually got a little bit of a following and we interacted with a chat room and all that stuff. And I think that's where we found, we both probably found our voice. I definitely found a voice with that. And, um, you know, eventually the show got really popular and then Farino fired Hallam and said, Hey, I'm going to replace my Hallam with myself. And I'm like, no, no, you're not. I'm not doing that. So me and Ryan <laughs> just like said, screw this. We're going over here. And we're going to go do something else. But yeah, I mean, it's weird because I've always felt like it, it's when we were on air, this is broadcasting like this. I don't talk in normal life, I, I guess, like, hey, what's for dinner? Are we getting enchiladas? I really like enchiladas. Like, <laughs> but when we're on air, it's like, that's what people expect. That's what it the job is. It's like we're supposed to stand out from people that are otherwise in traffic or on the treadmill or wherever they choose to be listening and absorbing our uh, our spoken content, so you know that's that that's sort of my whole vibe, and that's uh, sort of how I progressed, I guess, into this industry. Do you uh, do you get the uh, the the stuff from your wife after you finish a show or a podcast where she's like, um, "You're sure. not on air right now. Yes. You can bring it down a little bit." Yes, yeah, and my <laughs> I mean my poor wife Howard. I mean it's uh, I'm sure Jeff says the same thing, but man, my. Cause like I can't, I'm like this in real life. You know me in real life. Like yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm loud, but I'm not like that. But I have the same thoughts. I will pause a movie or television show. I'll be like, do you see? Um, and and just, she sits there like, oh god, please. She she thinks about killing herself. I'm sure of it. And she's like, I, I'm like, you see this? This is where the writers rewrote this scene because it wasn't good enough, and the producer came over the top and told them they had to do. This. And I've got like all these ideas and theories and see they rewrote this five times and that's why they settled on this see the c story arc of this movie isn't vibing where what where it was in the first 15 minutes in the last half hour and it, it's misery for her yes yeah because everybody loves the mid-movie rant right don't they, yes, of course. Don't they? I, I have gotten thrown out of my share of theaters i'll be honest with you See, I've never gotten thrown out of the theater, but like I'm sitting with my wife and I'll I'll kind of do the pause thing. I won't even pause the movie at that yeah. point. I'll just start talking. Talking over. So she's just, you know. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. because I'm sitting there and I'm watching the movie and I'm smoking and my mind's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I start smoking and all of a sudden it's like, you know, diarrhea of the mouth. It's like blah, blah, blah. Are you a background guy? Do you always notice the backgrounds of everything that's going on in the movie? Or do you only because I feel weird. I oh like what's on screen. Tom Cruise is jabber John over here. I'm like, what's going on over there? Like I am always drawn off the beaten path. I'm looking at backgrounds. Like I'm the king of you know the soda or whatever's filled up the glass when it's uh when you got a glass and it's half. You're full. looking for the editing edit problems. It is my life. My entire life is built around that. Hence See, why I'll be soon divorced. For for me, I try to guess everybody's height. <laughs> I was, come on, Rip, do you remember when we were, when we I were growing up, time. when we were growing up, did you think that Rocky Balboa yeah. was like, I mean, did you think that he was, he was probably like 6'2", right? He was a big dude, right? I had no idea the dude was 5'8", and I think about what 5'8 is now, or 5'6 for Tom Cruise, and now I'm like, I, I literally, because... Everything that we see, like through the movies and 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 whatever, uh, even the guys who I talk to, you know, at like Fantasy Alarm, who you know we haven't met in person or whatever, but like I'm sitting there talking to them, and I've like started to like ask guys, I'm like, how tall are you? <laughs> really? Just because I, I've never, I, I I don't know why it's like just some weird thing for me that I just obsess over the fact that the, I I just assume because you know I go to jam band shows. And for whatever reason, all the dudes at jam band shows are all like these like big six two guys. And so, you know, I have to like maneuver myself around there. So I just assumed everybody's taller than me in life. And then all of a sudden it was like, nah, oh, dude, Tom Cruise is five six. And I think about like that, and he's like up to here on me, really? Yeah. 
Movie stars, it's more proportionate. It's like anything. You can't, you know, that's why I like in, in sports, too. It's like you have, I believe, I'm, everyone says, oh, size doesn't matter. I'm like, yeah, doesn't it? Because, okay, if you're six foot, you could still be a good receiver. But what about five, you know, what about 5'10"? Okay, yeah, 5'9"? Yeah, 5'8"? 5'7", 5'6", 5'5". Like, eventually you hit somewhere where, okay, if you're 4'1", does it matter? It it, it matters. It's going to matter. Of course it matters. At some, there's a breaking point somewhere where it matters. And I think it's like that. Like, I'm not a handsome guy. But if I was 5'8", I'd be all right. I'd have a much smaller face. It'd be nice and tight. And cheekbones would be better. But no, they stretch my ass out. And by the way, I get that at fantasy conferences all the time. I remember your guy, Fensty, you know, first time. I, I, I have it all the time. Like, oh, you're a lot taller than I thought. Everybody says it to me at a fantasy convention all the time. You're taller than you sound. I'm like, what? Because Weird. every dude that everybody meets is like 5'8". Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's true. It's much smaller and much better looking. Uh, you, no. See, there yeah. you go. Like, you're... <laughs> because, like, no, seriously, right? <laughs> We're not a handsome group of people. Like, yeah. the fantasy industry... We have we have like one Jeff Radcliffe, right? Yeah, or just, we get like a or a Pat Mayo, oh, Nando DeFino. Like forget not, it. Have you ever not, looked at his eyes? It's oh. like the first time hearing the Beatles. <laughs> I'm so he, like I I went in the first time Mondo's talking. I just went in open mouth kiss him. He's like whoa whoa dude dude dude. I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know what, what I don't know where I even was for a second there. Right. I sit there. I sit there. I look. Jeff Radcliffe talks to me. I'm like. Mm. <laughs> it's so delicious so yeah. dreamy dreamy but but then again then we you know we've got like me and then you know i mean listen i'm not gonna berate everybody who's in the fantasy industry That's but we are true. not a good looking group of people no we're not no no so. it's not we're in it for more more than that so you you start off broadcasting now when you were doing the midnight show with hal were you married already uh, no, Hal never made it to the midnight show. Uh, that was, uh, that became me and Ted eventually. Like me, me and Hallam did the, oh, the midnight oil show you're talking about. I thought you were yeah. talking about yours. Yeah. My, my bad. Um, was I married at 10? Oh yeah. I've been married since 2000. So okay. and I had kids too, which is another very, very rare thing in our industry. A lot of people that we know, like are having kids now and I'm thinking, oh my God, I couldn't eat. I couldn't even imagine. I don't know how I made it through like sleeping babies and changing diapers. And that's one of the things I did the fantasy stuff at night. Right. And that's why I still do it to this day. A lot of writing and, and research overnight. And I did that because my wife's a morning person. So she'd wake up and take the early shift. I would have the late night shift with the kids. So I would just work and write and do whatever I had to do. Uh, and then the kids would scream and I'd give them a bottle or whatever. So that's like how I trained to do this job. Uh, you know, from 2002 through 2015. Because it's got, I mean, listen, it's, it's, it's rough. This is not the industry. If you want to make millions of dollars, this is not the industry to, to jump into. So, you know, obviously your wife working also, and then you working another job and making ends meet. So, you know, it's, it's, it's admirable to sit there and be able to have, you have three kids? Three kids. Yeah. Three uh, kids. Oldest is 19 now, 19, 16, and 10. She's going to college this year, right? Or she's in college. She's in college. She uh, she took college courses in high school and then did it in the summer last year when COVID hit. So she's already done with two and a half years of college. So she's got she's already she's taken uh, pre law. She's going to be one of the first sophomores at uh, Arizona State to take pre law courses already. So she's uh, yeah she's she's an academic. She's all about fast track and just you know never got nothing but A's her entire life, not even a close to a B. In fact, tears, the one time she got like a 92 in the class one time and like, <laughs> year, she was like eh. no, she's a high achiever. And uh, yeah, she, she's just very academic, her, the, late, the oldest one. So middle one, 16, that's obviously a, a, a girl, a teenager. That's got to be a nightmare all in its own right it, there. What about Xander? Xander's Xander's your boy. How old is Xander? He's ten. He's going to be eleven in a couple months. So is he a mini you? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's disturbingly so. Like, um, looks like me, talks like me, and then he just he does the things that like I don't push him. I never pushed any of the kids. I, I didn't want to like. Yeah, I love if they were into sports or not into sports, but I, I never was that kind of parent. I've seen that backfire uh, many times. 
So, but he would, he would do these things where like he would have a football flags and he'd like put them all on the floor, create a football field and play a game, you know? And I'm like, I am like, my brothers and sisters, like you, you taught him that. I'm like, I didn't say anything. He makes up player names. He'll, he'll go through like a Rolodex of, of players, find a player and, and like act out games and, and ha- like have ballparks and different stages like that. Like, it's wild. He does all that kind of stuff. I never taught him any of it. He just does it, and I just sit there bewildered because that's the stuff I used to do. I remember I had a sticker book one time, and I was reading their stats, and there's Mike Greenwell. I'm like, oh, I just like now. Nah. I was probably eight years old. I'm like, Greenwell, what a great name. I'm like, he's going to be my star player. And he was a nobody at the time. And like two years later, I think he won like a batting title or something for the Red Sox. So he was like one of my favorite players because I kind of like felt I called it. You know what I mean? So and he does that stuff all the time. He when I was waiting to come on the show, he was out there playing MLB the show, and he's got who was it? Um, Miles Straw hit a home run. He's like, "That's this is not factually accurate." He's like, <laughs> and he goes and looks at the rating, thirty two rating. He shouldn't be hitting a home run. I've got to change. And he's like, you know, he's he's wild like that. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. But I listen, you know what? He, he sat there for you know ten years just watching Dad. Yeah. Um, which is cool, man. Very nice. I have no kids of my own. I mean, I'm glad I don't have any kids of my own. I think the world is glad I don't have kids of my own. <laughs> but nevertheless. All right. So so let's talk about now. So you're, you're, you, you've jumped into the fantasy industry. You've done the show. Um, you hooked up with uh, with Al Williams over at Fantasy Alarm. And Great like, talk to me about like, because now you've you've gone through some interesting transitions here. It was like fantasy alarm and all of a sudden like the dfs community jumped in and like you know hammered the the fantasy community now all of a sudden we're seeing the betting community doing the same thing to the fantasy community that the dfs community did like you've made it through all of these transitions here i mean how's this ride been for you uh it, it's tumultuous it's i wouldn't have traded for anything i do want to say you know we're on fantasy alarm now without al williams that i don't exist in the world right i mean al williams is uh one of the most important people in my entire life changed everything gave me the opportunity uh to do this really because i mean you know it's starting out and there wasn't businesses there weren't real companies there's a bunch of people slopping work together it was like Peter Shanky, Greg Ambrosius, and there's like two other people in the entire industry. All right. And Al came along and said, we're going to do this. We're going to do professional. And I was just really lucky yeah, to get caught, to introduce to him, to be able to talk to him, help him out originally than him. I mean, changed my entire career because without him, I don't have, you know, I don't have the voice. You're right. I don't have the platform, the stepping stone. It's, it's so important. So Al's one of the most important people to me, and I love him to this day, no doubt about that. And Rick, too, uh, over there once Rick came in with Fantasy Alarm, too. So got to shout those guys out. But, yeah, it, it's a wild ride. I think that's why, you know, I'm very thankful for that opportunity that, you know, at Fantasy Alarm and Al and Rick and what, you know, they did. And that's the kind of stuff I look for in assembling my team, Italy Fantasy or Fantasy Guru and stuff, is that, now, I've been lucky to work with great people, yourself being one of them. Um, and it's like so many people think that they're going to come in and be rich immediately and they're just going to make tons of money. And then they, oh, I don't want to work weekends and I, oh, nights. And it's like, boy, they, they, for, they lose sight. And then I've had the other side of things where guys have skyrocketed. I worked with a bunch of them at Elite. They skyrocketed in um, uh, popularity and, and success. And then they're like, I don't do that anymore. I don't do that. And they forget. You get so, they got so egotistical that they forget what we are doing. What Howard, you and I do is we are here for people. We, right now, we're trying to entertain and engage an audience and people. We try to teach them how to be better fantasy players. We try to teach them how to, you know, uh, do statistical analysis, how to, you know, what to watch for when the right hander's on the mound, when Yuli Gurriel versus when a left, you know, at the plate. We're, we're trying to teach and help people. And I think sometimes, especially with DFS and sports betting, the more money that comes in, people really lose sight of why they're here and what this job really is. And it's it's for the people that are working nine to five. They don't have time to come home and crunch fan graphs or pro football uh, uh, focus and, and all that. You know, PFF, they don't have 
they don't have time to do that. And that's what we're here for. So um, it, it's been a wild ride and I've you know, met all kinds of people uh, through that journey. Well, you know, it's kind of funny you say that as far as like, you know, the type of people that you've met within the industry. And yeah, I did. Right. <laughs> the Chaim. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Good luck. Um, you know, we've kind of gone through all of that, too. And, you know, and, and here like, the thing for me is and this blows me away. And I know I know for a fact that you've gone through this because now you're talking about people who like don't want to work weekends and they don't want to work holidays and all the other bullshit that goes on with that. And, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, it fucking pisses me off beyond belief. It really does. And then people come to me looking for a job, you know, and it's like, you know, how do I break into this industry? How do I, you know, how do I, how do I do it? And, you know, I, I, when you and I were breaking into the industry, there was no, I mean, there was an industry, but it wasn't as super saturated as this, you know, every, everybody's got a podcast now and everybody can build a website and no, everybody can do a blog. And, you know, and I, and I say this to people, I'm like, find your voice, do a podcast, do it every day, write every day. Like this whole thing, and then people are like, Ugh, I'm not going to do that for free, no. And I'm like, well, then put some fucking Google ads on there. I don't give a shit how yeah. you do it, but the bottom line is is that you've got to grind it out, and they don't want to. So when somebody comes to you for how do I break into the industry, what you know, how do I get, how do I become a member of fantasy, you know, fantasy guru? How do I get that, you know, that thing? What do you tell them? Uh, I, I tell them keep going and it's like it's become one of my mantras because that's what people will start out and they're always excited when they start right and they, they'll join an organization like yours or ours or whatever and uh, or they'll do it on their own and then they're like exactly you don't get the fame you wanted you don't get the fortune you want you don't get the attention you want you don't get you know whatever it is so I like there's a lot of people in our space there's uh, so much shit put on social media because everybody wants likes because that's their currency. And they're like, I got to get likes. I got to get likes. Like, okay, I mean, fine. But, you know, that's not really helping people 180 characters of analysis. It's kind of garbage. I tell them to keep going, though. Um, you know, a, a lot of my opportunities have stemmed from just keep moving forward, keep grinding, keep moving, stay aware, stay in the game long enough to get noticed, stay in the game long enough so that, you know, what you eventually form whatever it is to that it pops and becomes popular you know your first wave your first version the beta version is never good right we have to understand that the first version of getting buzzed it's not going to be good and then in like two years you're gonna be like oh my god can you believe we did that because you evolved because you kept going right and that's what that's the hardest part to do so if you're serious about it you have to make set aside the time set aside the energy and know that you're going to fail and it's never going to pop the way you want or when you want but it'll if you keep going they'll have no the world will have no choice but to accept you and embrace you you will get those opportunities you desire and you crave but you have to keep it going when you think well this is odd you know that's it how many people are serious did that, Howard? I mean, you know, how many people? Yeah. That's why I didn't get a full-time job forever there. They, I remember Matt Deutsch told me, oh, you're going to be on opening day. And then, oh, yeah, we don't have a spot for you. It's like, okay. But eventually, <laughs> people got so mad because they weren't getting paid or weren't getting paid enough. And I was sucking up anything I could do. I'll do what, nights, weekends, midnights, overnight, whatever. I'll do anything. Like, just just give me the opportunity. Let me do it. And, uh, and that that's... That's it, man. It's not that difficult. What's your biggest pet peeve with that? With like the, with people with people who come looking and people yeah. who come trying. What you gotta have a, a a big pet peeve with that? A hundred of them. My number one pet peeve is people with pet peeves. Number two is oh no. Uh, <laughs> you know when it comes to the industry, I I think it's the it's that people want to do they want to like do hosting jobs they want to do articles right away and I, I try to start people out in more of an intern role where like okay just you know we were joking about player notes before we started here and it's like i mean it, it's it's terrible let's be honest it's the bomb but it, it's important that you you've gone through that so you know you know that angle of the business like um i got caught this is a true story i we've got a couple like billionaire investors over at the Elite Sports Network. These guys are real high. And I had a call with them. I've said this on air before, but recently, and they're like, Jeff, and they're yelling at me. Jeff, I get it. 
I get it. You're very blue collar. I get it. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I think they're being derogatory, but I'm not sure. I'm like, <laughs> if they're being mean, I don't, I don't care. It's like, I don't want to be, I, it's blue collar, white collar. I don't care. I want to know what everybody's going through, right? I want to know what the producer has is going through. I want to know what the editor has to go through. I want to know what the people writing player notes, what their schedules are like, what they're up against. I want to know those things because if I lose sight of that, then I, then I'm a bad manager. I'm a bad leader. You know, I, I don't know what's going on whether in their lives and what their job is. And I end up throwing so much work at them. So it's the people that don't want to start out and do the grunt work. That's my biggest pet peeve because everyone wants to start out and put their name on something, a blog, an article, a show, whatever. You need to produce the show, listen to the show, watch the show, watch other shows before you, you, you go up. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Well, Jeff, I don't want to take up all your time here at night because obviously you've got some MLB show to go play <laughs> and a wife to annoy. So let's our- wrap this up with a little round of uh, boomer bust. So here's the here's Ooh. what it is. Boomer bust. I basically I just I run through a couple of names okay. uh, in the sporting world or I have to get naked. You do not. Thankfully. Yes. Thank God. Uh, we, no, nobody. Listen, nobody needs to see that, Jeff. I do not. I was like, what? nobody. Okay. The okay. time that you invited me into the sauna with you and Ted so, Schuster. No. <laughs> There's so much sweat, so much stinky sweat. You've never. How is that big lump anyway? That Ted? dude loves to troll me when we're passing by each other. He is right. Crazy. Yeah, I hear that sometimes. Like on the shows, he'll he'll like say something about Howard. He will say something <laughs> at the end of our show that he knows will piss you off. Normally, it's about dogs or animals. He knows it, and just to get a rise, just to get. Oh my God! You don't get enough attention, do you? Like uh, that's why I just I hang up, disconnect, throw my shit down. I'm out because I don't know what that fucker's gonna say. But he's our. He's, <laughs> is the only he's like Encino man. He hasn't changed in thousands of years. He has not changed in a thousand, thousand years. years. All right, well here you go, boom or bust. I'm gonna give you a player. You're gonna tell me whether or not he's a boom or he's gonna be a bust, and you can you can have a, a few words on each guy if you want. Right. You ready? Yeah. I'm going to start it off with a nice, easy one here. Selfishly, I, I need to know your opinion on this. Talk to me. Robert Sala, new head coach of the New York Jets. Boom or bust? <sighs> boom. Um, boom only because you can not You can only be so bad when compared to Adam Gase. He's going to get the defense in order. Sala's a guy, at least on the defensive side. I don't know how he's going to develop Zach Wilson. Mike, Mike LaFleur, the, the jury is very much out. But fundamental football is what Robert Sala uh, preaches. He's very, very adept at adjusting secondary and in coverages. So I think the Jets, by default, that defense is going to be very solid. They spent some money. They're building it the right way on offense. So I'm going to say Sala's set up. It's going to be a positive next couple of years for the Jets. All right. We're going to move over to Atlanta. Two for the price of one. I know, yes, sometimes you have to pay double for that kind of action. Arthur Smith and Dave Ragone. Running Ooh. the Falcons. I hate Rangon. He is a crappy quarterback coach, in my opinion, that now he's going to get. I'm curious on who officially will get play calling duties there. And Arthur Smith is a guy that I, I said he only got his job with the Titans because his dad is the president of FedEx. And then he goes out and does a, a really good job um, with the Tennessee Titans. So that that surprised me. It's one I was definitely wrong about. I, I'm going to say I, I'll say boom because. That offense is so freaking good and so talented, provided they keep Julio Jones. It's going to be almost impossible to fail offensively. I think they were ninth in attempts and seventh in yards in passing last year. This is a really good offense. So I think Arthur Smith and Rangon, they're going to look good because of the talent they already have there. All right. I'm going to need this for a second as I do this. Uh, oh, yeah. What are you pouring there? New one. Oh, dude. Come on, man. A little Basil Hayde. Basil Hayde. Okay. Nice. Oh, yeah. All right. Boy's got the good stuff. That's all in I honor of Tony Larusa, oh. Chicago White Sox manager, Boomer Bust. Bust. Um, this hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. It, well, I mean, the, the, I was saying it today. The the White Sox have baseball magic. Like it, it when you get Billy Hamilton going five for five, and then the next day he sucks, and then Jake Lamb hits a home run. You lose your two of your three best stars, and Eloy Jimenez and Ro, uh, and Lewis Robert. Like, and and. Lucas Giolito is your worst pitcher all of a sudden. Like, I don't I love it. It's happened three times in my life. 1983, Tony Russo is manager. The year 2000, where they got bounced by the Mariners in the playoffs. 
And then 2005, they won the World Series. I've seen baseball magic on the South Side three times, and it's getting to that point for me. I think they've got some baseball magic. However, I think LaRusse is going to be the guy that keeps them down. He's going to do something here. Old Man River is going to do something to just blow it up. I could just feel it because he needs his hand mixed. In. He needs to be too Johnny on the spot, and I think he's going to screw it all up. Go to back to football, Cincinnati wide receiver, Jamar Chase. He's a boom. Um, I think it's going to hurt uh, uh, Tyler Boyd, and I think it's going to hurt T against quite a bit. It's just a relationship thing. you know. It's like you and I, Howard. I mean, we always get along, and we always favor one another. It's when you, when you're quarterback, I've talked about wide receiver chemistry and quarterback chemistry forever. When you have your guy that you trust, you throw them the football. It's just the way it goes. And Burrow stomped hard for uh, a Jamar Chase to be there in Cincinnati. And they had special chemistry at LSU and made both their careers. So I, I think he's going to be a boom. He's going to be the best receiver in the Bengals by a long shot. Jacksonville Jaguars head coach, oh. Urban Meyer. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> Bust. Urban Meyer, you know what? Urban Meyer, he's going to work in fantasy sports pretty soon. He, he's the guy who can't hang. He cannot do it. He rises up, does a bunch of good things. Everything looks like it's on track. And then he's just like, oh, I'm too exhausted. Bro, oh, I'm too tired. So somebody, you know, my neighbor, uh, neighbor needs new siding on their house. So I got to sit out a year. Like, that's what Urban Meyer does. He quits. He's a quitter. So I, I think he's going to bust. He's got this quarterback. He's got all these weapons um, in Jacksonville, all the the, uh, the means necessary. But I think he busts because he can't hang. Sirius XM producer Phil Backer as a matchmaker slash dating consultant. Oh, my God. As a dating consultant? Well, I love how you're specific on that. Uh, and everything <laughs> Phil Backer does is a boom. So he's like, there's some, you know, some people are just winners. Like, no matter what they do, they're just winners. Phil will find a way, even though dating is probably his worst category. If this was Jeopardy. Crazy, like, right? Uh, it's crazy. It's, Good looking dude. Built, stacked. Oh, nice as crazy. fuck, right? It's ridiculous. Like, uh, my guy, he's the nicest guy in the, in the universe. He's smart. He's very successful. Like, yeah, that dude, I can't, I can't believe he's still single. <laughs> but he's still a boom. I, I trust Phil. He'll fill. And Phil, I trust. Victor Robles, outfielder for the Washington Nationals. I, I hate I hate you that you know me so well because I have Robles and it's been painful. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm sticking to it. I'm sticking to the boom. I got to got to move up in the order though. Him hitting eighth is is just bad. He's too patient of a hitter. He gets behind the count while he's hitting down in the lineup. He he they need to ride with him towards the top of the lineup. Hit him first or second. That's the ideal spot for him. Let him. Let him grind the pitcher down a little bit. Let him get some fastballs ahead of Juan Soto. That, that, so I think there's more of a boom there. He's a good hitter, a good contact guy, a hard contact guy, fast. He's got a little bit of pop. So the skills are there, but got to move up in the order. Boom. Back to football. Clint Kubiak, offensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, God. Again, you know me so well. No, screw him. I, I hate nepotism. We worked together for how long, dude? You I taught know. me how to analyze football the way you analyze football. I know, and you've gotten too good. You're, uh, it, it's like <laughs> this. It's like, listen, we talked about my son earlier, and I sort of, my wife and I had that. My wife's like, well, you know, if he doesn't, if he's not an NBA star, and I'm like, if? Like, he's not an NBA star. He thinks he's going to be. But I'm like, I don't want people – I want him to be doing player notes or something. You know what I mean? I want. I don't – just because your dad is somebody and made something, it doesn't mean you are. I hate this nepotism in the NFL. I really despise it. Kubiak, is he going to be able to teach that zone blocking scheme the way that – you know, we're like Alex Gibb, Rick Dennison, and, and now we're going into like the kids of Kubiak? I don't know. I'm going to say bust. I – I – the kids don't try as hard. They don't have, you know, it's like the movie Multiplicity, right? A copy of a copy. You like yeah, that. Steve. Yeah. yeah. I got a lot. I, I, drive, I drive a car. I want some pizza. I want some pizza, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Clint Kubiak is. He's the last chain of the Multiplicity. Right? He's, the, he, he's the last Michael Keaton in the thing. He puts pizza in his wallet. <laughs> Uh, well, damn, if that doesn't just take a big dump all over Dalvin Cook shares. Uh, I think he'll be all right. They upgraded the offensive line good uh, enough. I think Cook will still be solid. 
this year. I worry about going into the future, though, with uh, Kubiak and that, that, adjusting that running scheme. I'm just going to call him Steve from now on when I'm on the air. Yes. Um, all right. Wait, I got, I got two more here for okay. you. The first one is another twofer. Okay. Uh, let's go to Philadelphia. Nick Sirianni and Shane Steichen. Oh, um, boy. I'm going to say bust because everything in Philadelphia busts. Like, they just can't get it right. That miracle of 2017, just a miracle. Again, football magic is what the Eagles had. But this organization seems really cocked up. Uh, they had a uh, uh, Trent Balky, who is now, what is he? Uh, uh, he? I can't remember what organization he's at now. Oh, he's in Jacksonville running the show. He was in Philadelphia. Huge analytics guy. Like, you know, he's the guy. He's what Billy Bean pretends to be. You know what I mean? With D, uh, uh, Paul D. Podesta was, you know, like the numbers guy. That's who Balgi is on the football side. And Eagles let go of that whole department. They they built it up 2016, 2017. And then he left because they wouldn't pay him. The whole analytics department has now dysfunctioned. Peterson's out, all the coaches. Stuff. So I think Sirianni and Steichen are in a real bad spot. The moves that they made in the NFL draft, drafting uh, Gainwell, Bringing in, bringing Jordan Howard back. You, why are you bringing so many running backs to the fold? What the fuck are you doing? Stop doing this thing. And so I, I think they're going to bust. I just, I don't, I think they're set up to fail. All right, last one. Here we go. It's a doozy. Okay. Ted Schuster as a girls' high school basketball coach. He's a bust. He's terrible. <laughs> he cares too much. There is not. Ted lo- loves nothing. If I was on fire and Ted had a, a, a fire extinguisher, like he wouldn't even, he'd be like, I don't know. He'd just set the fire extinguisher down and smoke. Like he, he'd, he'd light, light a cigarette off of you. Yes, he'd light a cigarette off of my flame. <laughs> and um, he, he, is, he cares too much. And like he fights with the referee. He coaches uh, Baswell. He fights with the referee. Hey, dude, I call him in the morning. I'm like, all right, well, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what I want to talk about. So he's like, hey, these fucking referees, I tell you, there wasn't a foul on it. I'm like, Ted, I don't care. I didn't see the game. It wasn't on ESPN Ocho. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care. He is so into it. It's I'm, uh, these, these referees got paid $25 to ref this game. They don't care if your team wins or somebody else. They don't care. He thinks everybody's out to get him. So he's destined to bust. He cares too much. Only thing he cares about in the world. <laughs> that and cigarettes. And cigarettes. He loves smoking. <laughs> last true Marvel, man. The last of the Marvel, man. Well, Jeff, thank you so much, man. Really appreciate you sitting down with me, getting a chance to uh, to chat. I, I, man, I just uh, I never get a chance to catch up with you anymore, man. This is awesome. We're too busy. Maybe maybe another pandemic will hit and we'll both lose our jobs so we can just sit on the phone all day. There you go. <laughs> How about so, that for a Captain Downer? How about that? We'll I need a couple. I need a couple of fish shows in between now and that happening first. I, I agree. Oh, I saw that response the other day. You said yes, fish shows. So, what are you most excited? I said, what are you most excited about? Post fish tour. Fish tour. <laughs> when is it this year? Is it uh, in July? How long are you going for? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to do some sporadic stuff, but of course I already had to say that, you know, cause they're, they're doing Halloween in Vegas again. So it's like right before Rayo, you know, it's, it's labor day in Colorado oh. and then it's Halloween in Vegas. So it's like, yeah, oh, sorry. Bad oh. Deutsch here. Howard, you can't take off the time like that. Howard, it's the most important time of the year. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll go on a two week vacation, two weeks leading up to the season though. That's fine. <laughs> but you can't take off mid October. And he's telling you that the day before he leaves, yeah. while he's also letting you know you're not on the broadcast team for the NFL. <laughs> NFL draft? Yeah, I got I got that nut punch. But many times, oh yeah, you got it this year. I got it the last two years. I got absolutely destroyed. I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> oh, terrible. You're not part of the. He literally said something to me like, "You're not. All right, you're not the A team." I'm like, oh, uh, okay. Like, I don't know. Oh. Good grief, man. My God, it's the worst. It's the uh, worst. Yeah, you're right. But I well, mean, again, thank you, though, dude. I really appreciate it. This was fun. I love it. Let's do it again sometime. Let's definitely do it again sometime. Ladies and gentlemen, from Elite Fantasy, well, it's Elite Sports Network and Fantasy Guru, right? Yeah, Elite Fantasy and Elite Sports Betting. I guess, we have like five sites. I can't even, I, I can't even keep track. <laughs> <laughs> all right brother well thank you again man i will talk to you 
very Thanks, soon. Guys. See you guys. Bye. Thanks for doing it. That sound you hear right there. Last call. That means it's time for last call. Last call. The NFL knows how to market itself, and every other sport needs to take a page off of this. Baseball, hockey, even basketball. All right, because if you want to know what the kids want to see right now, the kids want to see the drama. The kids want to see the rivalries. And MLB was almost there with the Trevor Bauer, Fernando Tatis stuff going back and forth, but then it just died and they just let it go. And I haven't seen MLB do any kind of marketing against that or try to, you know, boost up rivalries, whether it's Dodgers and Giants or Yankees and Red Sox. Whatever the Cubs and and White Sox or Cubs and Cardinals, it doesn't matter. MLB does not focus its attention or its its media on the uh, you know on on stuff like that. The NFL does it right. Okay, they give the fans what they want. Their fans want football. They give them not just football, but they give it football with drama. Like Ryan said, it's almost like the WWE writers were the schedule makers there, um, and they did certain things. Sam Darnold against the Jets in week one. Brady versus Belichick in week four. They sit there and they make these things happen. And that right there is catering to what the fans want. And that's the problem with MLB is that they're not catering to what the fans want. They're busy fighting over things like uh, this owner want this billionaire owner wants to move to a waterfront stadium in a city that can't afford the stadium that it already has. All right, they're sitting there, baseball sitting there talking about old school, unwritten rules, and we're worried about guys getting beaned for celebrating with a bat flip. These are the problems with MLB right now. All right, they're not catering to what the fans want. You want to bring the younger generation in there, get them excited about it. Hockey needs to do it also. Where the hell was hockey all year until Tom Wilson of the Capitals? Uh, laid out some dude on the Rangers. And then the next game that they played against each other, everybody fought. Now, I'm not saying that you want to celebrate hockey for the fights, all right, or celebrate NASCAR for the for the crashes. I'm not trying to, to, to work on stuff like that. But what you need to do is you need to listen to what your fans want. What are your fans responding to? There was an old movie called Rollerball back in the 70s with James Kahn and John Houseman. And and that was one of the things that they were really talking about. And, you know, they, they, they had the players doing things that they probably shouldn't have done to cater to the fans. I'm not saying that baseball has to do things that are going to put people in harm's way. But if Trevor Bauer is having fun making YouTube shows over, you know, against Fernando Tatis, well, then you know what? Feature it. Show stuff like that. Hype it up. Make sure that this is what people want. Market yourselves better. If you guys don't market yourselves better, then the NFL is going to end up expanding to 16 teams, to, I mean, to, to, to 60 teams or, uh, you know, a, a full six month, you know, seven month schedule, eight month schedule. They'll take over the whole year because they give the fans what they want and the fans open up their wallets to it. So MLB. NBA, NBA does a good job of marketing themselves, but NBA, MLB, NHL, you guys need to step up your games. All right. You want to pay your salaries. You want to make money for the owners. You want to make money through TV rights and stuff like that. Give the fans what they want. Take a page out of, out of the NFL. Lord help us, but they're doing it right. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of getting buzzed for Ryan Hallam. I'm Howard Bender. We'll catch you next time.